session we're going to start with how you were attracted to the feminine archetype and came to write the book with Jules Cashford of the goddess, about the goddess. Yes, well it was quite fascinating really. We were both in training as Jungian analysts, I think possibly in our first year even, and I felt attracted to Jules right away. I thought, what a nice woman. And a little while into our training, she had a dream in which she was told to go and see me and that we were to repair um, an altar that, that had got overgrown and was covered yes. with, with uh, briars mm -hmm. and, you know, sort of general um, debris. And so she came to dinner at my house and we had a long talk and we said, I think, why can't we write something about the feminine archetype? Why can't we really bring this forward into the culture? We didn't know at that time that other women were doing this. And so we said, well, where should we begin? And we thought, well, at the beginning, we'll, we'll start with the Greek goddesses. But then when we got to the Greek goddesses, <laughs> we realized that we had to go further back. What was the ground which laid the, the preparation or the foundation mm -hmm. of the Greek goddesses? And then having got to the Neolithic era, we thought, well, why not go further back? Why not go right <laughs> back to the beginning, to the Paleolithic? And at the same time, we found a wonderful book by Alexander Marshak called mm -hmm. The Roots of Civilization, yes. which was all about um, the moon and the way that the early peoples related to the moon mm -hmm. and observed the moon and notated all the, the uh, phases of the moon. So that really set us going. I think that book, together with Joseph Campbell's uh, great survey um, of that early time really got us going. And then we discovered the work of um, Maria Gugimbutas, the Lithuanian archaeologist, and a book called Goddesses and Gods of Old Europe. Now that I found right in the first year, way back in the probably 1980 or even before, whenever it was published, and I was really struck by that and excited by it. Mm -hmm. So I discussed all this with Jules and we thought, well, we'll go back to the beginning we'll find the images of the feminine from that early time. And we found our beginning with a wonderful image, which is now in the museum in Bordeaux, of the goddess of Locelle, what's been yeah. called the goddess of Locelle. I know, that's one of my favorites. And it is one, of, it was one of our favorites. And Jules minutely analyzed the meaning of the relationship between the uh, goddess's hand or the woman's hand on her womb and the, uh, the moon mm -hmm. and the crescent-shaped um, bison's horn that she was holding in her hand which had 13 marks mm -hmm. on it um, indicating the phases of the rising moon. So we immediately saw the connection between the woman's body and the, the lunar system as mm -hmm. it were. Mm -hmm. And from that, that was our starting point. And that's beautiful too because it goes back to your dream in which you saw the cosmic feminine with the wheel yes. and you were to adjust your wheel to the cosmos. That's right. And yes. in this this goddess or this woman is clearly related to the cosmos, to the moon, and to all of nature. And that was already there in yes. that one image. That's what's so the extraordinary. She was originally lying see. down. Oh, she was lying down over um, a rock shelter. Mm -hmm. But of course, in the museum, she's standing up, and she's always shown in books uh, in her upright position. Yes. But possibly she was uh, lying there dreaming. Even you know, one doesn't mm -hmm. know what mm -hmm. they had. Whoever carved that wonderful image. What was he thinking when he carved mm -hmm. it? It's not very large. I can't remember the exact dimensions, but not very large. Anyway, anyway that was our starting point. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we um, discovered through Campbell the different images of the feminine uh, as, I think, great mother, really. I think that's what the image of that time meant. Um, the great mother perhaps representing already the earth, but they didn't know about the earth at that time. They couldn't have. So it's much more likely that she represented the cosmos. And the image that's, for instance, in Vienna, in the museum there, the tiny little uh, image of um, a woman with um, a kind of arrangement around her head, which is like the actual um, trajectory of the stars around a, a certain um, you know, pattern in mm -hmm. the heavens. We thought it was much more likely that that's what she represented. So we, we wrote that in our book. Why did you say that they didn't know about the earth? Well, they wouldn't have known, they, they would have known the, the earth as under their feet, so to speak, but they wouldn't have known the wholeness of the earth at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. They couldn't have known what we know now, 
the, the shape of the earth, the roundness of the earth, mm -hmm. or the earth in relation to the um, sort of the whole cosmos, but they would have known the sun and the moon, and they would have observed from the earth what mm -hmm. was happening, what was the moon doing in relation to the earth, what was the sun doing in relation to the so earth. So they would have known because of the sun and the moon, the rhythms of the they earth. They would have known the rhythms, exactly, mm -hmm. of the earth, and, and the, the lunar rhythms, of course, and mm -hmm. they would have observed that the moon affected the water, probably the tides mm -hmm. of the yes. sea and things like yes, that. Yes, I think they were They're extremely observant, observant far, far yes, more than we are. Yes. And also they thought analogically, they didn't, uh, synthetically, they didn't separate things, they no. brought things together. Mm -hmm. And they made, obviously, a, a, a cosmology. And this woman represented the main, I think, um, component of that com cosmology. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit more about the significance of the moon? Well, the moon, we decided, and Jules really was, I think, the um, person who focused on this particularly, because she later wrote a book called The Moon, Myth and Image, which is an absolutely extraordinary study of lunar culture. Mm -hmm. But we saw, as we progressed in this uh, research, we saw that there was what one might call the lunar era, when the whole focus of life was on the um, birth, death, and regeneration of life mm -hmm. in relation to the seasons of the year, in relation to the crops, which they began to grow in the Neolithic, in relation to the um, whole cosmos, really, and also in relation to human life, because, well, they could see, quite obviously, that there were phases of human life which related to the phases of the moon, mm -hmm. the new life, the life at the full, and the waning life as people move towards death. So everything was a whole, really, a cosmology that united all aspects of life. Mm -hmm. And that pre uh, really prevailed, I think, for some 20,000 years, maybe far longer, we have no idea, because they've discovered now this wonderful system of caves at a place called Chauvet, Chauvet Caves in France, in the Vaucluse area, which are, um, I think they date back to 32,000 BC, whereas Lascaux uh, dates back to about 12,000 mm -hmm. BC. So who knows where this lunar mythology and this lunar cosmology originated? And recently, there have been discoveries in Germany of a figurine, female figurine, of about 42,000. Really? Yes, yeah. and know. a flute. Uh, yeah. They think it's the oldest flute in the world. Yeah, and yes, it's 40 and 38,000, so that mm -hmm. means we, we have no idea of how far back that culture actually yeah. does extend. And I think as people discover more and more, much more will be revealed about the origins of these ideas. Oh, I think so. And then, of course, this grew up, and the lunar culture of that very early time grew into the great myths of the Bronze Age, mm -hmm. and which also belong to lunar culture because they're all about death and regeneration. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. yes, that there is a cycle, that there is not an end. There's not an end, that, that everything is regenerated. So you have the great myth of Isis and Osiris in Egypt, you have in Sumeria, you have the myth of Inanna, the moon goddess, her descent into the underworld, and her hanging on a, on a hook in the realm of her sister goddess, Arishka girl, for three nights. In the underworld. In the yeah. underworld, mm -hmm. which, which of course fe corresponds to the dark phase of the moon. Yes, I and wanted they, you to they, talk they, about they that. They built yeah. the myths ar around the lunar phases. Yes. And then you also have in Greece, you have the um, d myth of Demeter and Persephone, and how Persephone was um, snatched into the underworld by Hades, how she married him, and how Demeter made such a fuss that... Uh, <laughs> She to said, get her back. <laughs> get her back. If you don't, to, to Zeus, she said, if you don't um, get her back, the earth will be desolate and nothing will grow. So that couldn't be allowed to happen. So she was um, allowed to send Hermes into the underworld to fetch Persephone. And as Persephone came back each year, so the earth was regenerated. Such a beautiful, beautiful myth. It is beautiful, and it's saying that if death is the end, there can be no life. That's, That's right. Yes. And there's another wonderful part of that myth when... Uh, Hades does take her. It's an, uh, almost in the moment that she's abducted that she conceives a new child. A new child. And so brings death, him back from the underworld. Brings him back. As the new life. As the new life. So yeah. it's, it's the moment that death touches her, mm. she conceives. And it really shows that cycle beautifully. That's a beautiful way of putting it, yes. But you know, I've told you this before, but uh, after Pishti, my son died, uh, I, Maria Gembutis, as a matter of fact, had the publisher send your book to me because mm. she knew I was looking for a oh, book. Oh, really? Yes. yes, I didn't know that. Yes, she yeah. did. And when I received it, I was so impressed. And 
I began to use it in the class that I was teaching in mythology mm -hmm. as one of the texts. But a student invited me to the ocean, to a home uh, on the ocean, for a week after that, after my son died. And I took your book with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I read the section on the moon. Mm -hmm. And that was so healing for me at that time to read about the phases of the moon. I knew this abstractly, but when I was reading it after the death of a child, the dark phase of yeah. the moon, and you talk about that so beautifully, so would you yeah. talk about those phases again and how that gave people the comfort and healing that I received yes, in just reading about people it? People trusted that they would be reborn like the, the, the crescent moon was after mm -hmm. the dark phase. They trusted that after their own death or the loss of a child, as in your case, or the loss of any loved person, that that person would be regenerated from mm -hmm. the womb of the goddess and they would reappear on earth just as the crops were regenerating. Mm -hmm. So they had a trust in life. This is the mm -hmm. most important thing. They weren't afraid in the sense of we're afraid of death. Mm -hmm. um, death was a phase before rebirth. And this was so important. It was absolutely um, deeply imprinted in the psyche of that time for many thousands of years. However difficult the circumstances of life were, which mm -hmm. undoubtedly they were, but there was this trust that um, this was not the end. And also they believed, most wonderfully, they, they believed that the Milky Way was the path by which souls left mm -hmm. the Earth and by which they returned. They went to other parts of the cosmos, possibly to um, certain constellations, mm -hmm. and then they returned via the Milky Way and to the Earth, and then they were reborn. Such a lovely image, it is and it connected beautiful. people to the cosmos. To the cosmos. That was so important. Mm -hmm. And that came, comes back in Egyptian mythology as well, doesn't it? The Absolutely. stars and the Milky Way. But isn't that really then a core issue of prehistory, of the spiritual tradition of prehistory, that, that there is a trust? Because when the people saw the dark of the moon, they didn't feel afraid that there was nothing beyond that because they had observed for thousands of years that there is a period of darkness but that the light always returns. That's right, for that phase, that was so, but when we move into the later phase, mm -hmm. the solar era, then the dark becomes terrifying. Mm -hmm. Yes, but this we're, is the core is the, of lunar of tradition. Of lunar tradition, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll come to the, perhaps mm -hmm. the solar later on. So you would say that that symbol really reflects the core absolutely. principle. And that is a total trust, really, in the universe, and, and in the earth, and the cosmos, something that we don't know much about, no, is that, that they were a part of they it. They were a part of it. They participated in the life of the cosmos, mm -hmm. and experienced that life within their own lives. There mm -hmm. was no separation between mm -hmm. their life, the life of the earth, and the life of the cosmos. And there was no cutting was off one. of life. There was no cutting off. Whereas when you get the Christian myth, which is also about death and regeneration, because Christ was resurrected from the dead, mm -hmm. but you don't, it, the connection with the earth is broken. It's broken. Mm -hmm. You don't get Christ coming back to earth again except in mm -hmm. the millennial um, anticipations from the book of Revelation, which is mm -hmm. interesting that they appear almost to compensate for that missing bit of the lunar myth, that we have to have the return of, yes. of Jesus to the earth. But it's, it's out of the context of the cosmos and it's out of the co context of the earth. It's a historical <laughs> return. It's a one and, one and only kind of event which mm -hmm. happened and which may happen in the future, but it's not a continually mm -hmm. recurring process. Nor is it that divinity is latent within the life process itself. Mm -hmm. Divinity has to come from outside. From outside, once yeah. yes. And in, have in Christ going down into the underworld, sometimes people ask, well, why did he have to go to the underworld as though it's an unfortunate place to go and why did he have to go there? But it's the myth. It's the myth, yeah, exactly. It's right. the old myth coming back and they're, they're superimposing it on the circumstances of um, Jesus' life and, and death and, and resurrection. Mm -hmm. um, the, the old lunar myth comes through so he had to go down during the dark phase, so to speak, yes. it, before he was reborn as mm -hmm. the new crescent. That's right, and it's, it's right, and it's wonderful because then he is both visible and invisible. And somewhere I read in your works that you were talking about, it's about 90-some percent of the universe is invisible to us. Yes, exactly. And we, so, only, we only see 4 percent, I think. Yes, yeah. and so we think that what we can't see isn't real, isn't and, we're, yeah. and we're really talking about uh, ninety-six percent of the universe that doesn't exist because we can't see it. <laughs> and but the old myth kept that uh, reality before us with the moon 
uh, mythology. The totality of the moon also mm -hmm. was very important as a symbol of, of totality. Mm -hmm. And then the, the different phases gave us the image of time. Mm -hmm. So you have time and eternity connected. Connected, and visibility and, and invisibility. And exactly. So there was no stark separation between the light and the dark, mm -hmm. or between um, this life and the other life. It was one unified whole, and, and that's so important in, in lunar culture. Yes. And that's what we've lost. And it's also no separation between ourselves and the divine. Exactly. Or ourselves and nature and the cosmos. Because we were part of it. We are part, we're just mm -hmm. a reflection of it. Uh, well, reflection perhaps isn't the best word, but it's just an extension of it. Yes, or an expression, expression. of it, an expression mm -hmm. of it, yeah. That everything that lives is a part of the divine. Exactly. Yeah, yeah or is divine. <laughs> well, that's one uh, wonderful symbol of the feminine, the moon. What other symbols did you and Jules find as you went along in writing this book, which is very, very long and very involved? Very detailed, yes. Yes, which is wonderful because it's uh, you can go to it for reference for the rest of one's life. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a big book, not to be read all at once, I must no, say. No, no, <laughs> no. I think that what uh, really drew us also was to discover what happened to the feminine archetype in Christian culture or in the patriarchal cultures. Why did it get lost? Why was this earlier vision so um, distorted or yes, when only it's so fragments healing. when it's so healing? And when it gave so much to people, why was it necessary, to, if it was necessary, to lose that and move into a different phase of, one's, of the world's evolution or humanity's evolution? So we. We then questioned um, what were the factors which um, destroyed the old goddess culture and brought into being the new culture which was focused on the god, God the Father. And of course we rely heavily on uh, Maria Gimbutas's work here because I have no doubt that there did exist an extraordinary early culture, you can call it the megalithic culture, stone age culture, neolithic culture, what you will. So after the Paleolithic and the lunar culture. I mean, it was still... Still right into the Neolithic and into the Bronze Age, too. Yes, still yeah. it continuing. But tell us more then about the Neolithic. Well, the Neolithic was the time when these great stone circles and stone monuments were erected. They were extraordinary. I mean, how they actually built these things with the weight of the stones, how they got them to where they were. There are many, many of them all over Europe. But, of course, the most famous is Stonehenge and Avebury. Uh, there's not much left of Avebury, but um, originally it was an enormous earthwork which culminated in um, around a place called Silbury Hill. Anyway, what is quite clear is that the land was sacred and that they, uh, whoever they were, made connections all over Europe, probably in touch with each other. Um, with building these great monuments mm -hmm. and that they were used for the purposes of observing the moon and the sun mm -hmm. and of connecting the earth with the cosmos. Definitely connecting yeah. it with the cosmos and actually they found uh, these monuments all over the earth now and recently uh, one in Egypt before Egyptian civilization began mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. and it, they're, they're amazing things that they're discovering about that in the, the, the connections that are made on the ground with the cosmos, mm. more than almost any other so monument. They obviously had tremendous mathematical knowledge, yes, they did. as well as power of observation, and a, a, a way of recording mm -hmm. uh, the movements of the moon and the sun, mm -hmm. exactly and precisely, which mm -hmm. they must have communicated to other people living in other countries and, and places. So anyway, that there, there was a, a very strong foundation of observation of the heavens, the development of um, astronomical skills and related to how to perhaps safeguard the crops that they were growing, how to conserve them over the winter, all sorts of things that they knew, which I didn't know when we actually wrote the book, but which I've discovered since. And um, so this laid the foundation. And then there are the Mediterranean cultures, the ones that grew up in the what's called the Fertile Crescent in Egypt and Palestine and Anatolia. And they were all connected by the same mythology, but not so much by the megalithic culture. That was more to do with, it seems to me, with Western Europe. Although, of course, you have the tremendous building of the pyramids in mm -hmm. Egypt, um, which the knowledge of that, uh, how to build those, must have spread far and wide. 
Yes, and certainly they exist in Central and South America. Exactly. So there was a connection between these very early cultures mm -hmm. in the sense that they were focused on the cosmos. Yes, and I think we'll probably discover in the near future that there really was a worldwide culture mm -hmm. that was the seafaring culture because maps have been found and artifacts that are very similar yes. all over the world. And I think it was Hapgood, uh, Charles Hapgood, yes. who had uh, discovered, or not discovered, but they, some had been brought, maps had been brought to his attention that convinced him that there was a worldwide culture. Mm -hmm. And that would make sense since we found uh, evidence of the megalithic culture worldwide. Yes, I think so. And it was obviously much greater than we had any idea of until very, oh, yeah. very recently. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that laid the foundation for the, for the Bronze Age. And then gradually, as, uh, as far as the Mediterranean and European area was concerned, uh, these peaceful cultures, because I think they were peaceful, um, gradually were infiltrated by quite a different kind of people who were not focused on the relationship between the Earth and the cosmos, but much more on the idea of um, territorial power, I think, because they had no settled place. When they found a place where they wanted to settle, they wanted to be, as it were, the, the, the conquerors. They wanted mm -hmm. to own it and develop it and do what and they wanted. And control it so and that control they could it. depend on it, I guess. Maybe. But anyway, they, they little by little, they destroyed the old goddess culture and overlaid it with a dip, totally different mythology. And so this was around... I think Gimbuta says 4,000 BC. I think it probably began around then, but it was still happening, for instance, in, uh, in India um, around 1500 BC, mm -hmm. which is a good deal later, the mm -hmm. Aryan invasion of northern India, where they drove all the original Dravidian people mm -hmm. down into the south. Mm -hmm. So I think this was a, a huge movement of peoples, um, as I say, two different mythologies um, clashing with each other and eventually the solar mythology which was the new mythology overriding the old lunar mythology mm -hmm. and the older connection uh, between mm -hmm. the earth and people's lives and the cosmos. You also have possibly one of the theories is that there could have been famine in the say Arabian desert mm -hmm. or in the Russian steppes, yes. those two areas where they thought they were to come from. Because they were coming from, from Russia up Yes, uh, from and, and the desert. westwards from the desert. Mm -hmm. And it could have been that famine drove these people out mm -hmm. and led them to seek places where there was mm -hmm. more food mm -hmm. and where and they could water. possibly mm -hmm. settle and water. So those are the two main factors. One was sort of an infiltration, not exactly an invasion, but an overpowering of the older culture. Mm -hmm. And, I and like secondly, the, the famine. And secondly, yes. And I like your image of, which is a accurate, uh, it really explains and reflects what actually happened, is that they, as they swept in from Russia, they pushed everyone down to the bottom <laughs> of the map, so to speak. Yeah. And the same thing happened in their spreading across Europe and down into Greece. And finally, they went quite late into Crete. So it was a... Yeah, they did. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. And they destroyed that culture completely. And then mm -hmm. the earthquakes and the tidal waves mm -hmm. finished it off. Mm -hmm. But there must have been an extraordinary culture. And I don't know, I mean, one imagines it was very nice to live in. But obviously, as I said, life could have been as harsh as it is in some parts of the world today. We don't really know. But um, what interested me was that really a whole layer of the psyche was, was lost because... This was an experience of the psyche, of the, soul, of the human soul, that it knew in this early time. And this was literally forgotten or overlaid with a whole cultural layer, like a cake, really. And mm -hmm. people only saw the top layer. They didn't know anything about the bottom layer. And that was lost. That's a wonderful image mm. of something. And that this lower layer just sank deeper. Deep, sank deeper and deeper. Into the unconscious. Into the unconscious. Un or it became unconscious, one mm -hmm. could say. Yes. It became unconscious. And this was really also very much an instinctual uh, civilization or culture, very much um, not a one that we have now, which has the development of mind and the rational intellect, although they were brilliant in their mathematical knowledge. Yes, yes. But they were still connected to their deepest instincts. They, they didn't violate them. Mm -hmm. uh, like our culture does. Let's talk a little bit about instinct because we have thought of instinct as something that we need to repress in many cases and in, that, in the lunar culture that was not the case. Um, no, I don't think there was any sort of um, ideology of, of repression at all in that culture. There may have been uh, in certain places 
there certainly was human sacrifice to do with the dark phase of the moon but one can't say specifically that it belonged to I think Campbell goes into this much more in detail than I can do it now but um, there wasn't the fear of the instinct because people were living it it was only when we began to develop um, I think with the coming of writing and with the development of left hemispheric thinking that everything to do with this older instinctive layer got, as it were, not quite demonized, but anyway, regarded with fear. Yes, and related to, uh, here, here this is exactly instinct, is what relates us to the cosmos, exactly. to the earth and to yeah, cosmos. Precisely. And if we are all one, then the laws of nature would be expressing themselves in our instinctual life. Exactly. And it would be instinct that would give rise to rituals which mm -hmm. connected us mm -hmm. to yes, the cosmos. Yes, well that's good, yeah. Yeah, so it's not something rather nasty that we need to get on top of or get away from. It's something that we need to reconnect with. Absolutely, but for at least 2,000 years, it's been considered as something nasty and that we should disconnect yes, from. Yes, absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. But this came in with the myth of the fall. Mm -hmm. I don't know at what phase you would like to move on to talk about that. Well, it's probably... we could do that now. Um, okay, well... If I we've said enough about the goddess, actually we'll always be coming back to the goddess and the core of and the, uh, core. the early... Well, we, we, I think there's very, something very important that I should say here, which is that when you have a different image of God coming in, totally different from the old great mother image mm -hmm. of the goddess, you have a, a transcendent image of deity mm -hmm. who is creating earth as something separate from himself. Mm -hmm. He's not giving birth to the whole of the cosmos and the whole of life out of his womb, so to speak, because he hasn't got a womb. <laughs> but with the Great Mother, everything came forth from her womb. Mm -hmm. So you have a different concept of reality. You have a sense of separation between deity and the earth, mm -hmm. which you didn't have before. Mm -hmm. And you didn't have the regeneration of life happening within the body of the deity. That's gone. Yeah. And so the trust is lost, and fear begins to replace it. Fear of this deity who may be a punishing, vengeful, judgmental God, mm -hmm. rather than um, the, the goddess who, who was life, really, mm -hmm. who was all life. It's such a beautiful image. I think it's good just to go back and focus on that image for a while of the Earth Mother, or the Cosmic Mother, who gives birth to every aspect of nature out of her own body. Mm. Exactly, out of her own being. Out of her own being. Yeah. So it could never happen that she would say, that I will destroy my creation because I am displeased with it. That's something that wouldn't seem to... It wouldn't, wouldn't occur. Wouldn't no. occur to in that In that lunar era, no, it wouldn't because occur. It's like when the male god says, I am displeased with my creation and I will blot it out utterly. And I'll send a flood to destroy it. Yes, mm. it's as though it is something so separate from him, mm. so inferior to him, that he will blot it out. Whereas the mother it is everything that she has made is her, it's, it's part her, of her. Yes, and not only that, but a lot of animals, even the hedgehog and the bear, um, the butterfly and the bee, they were all associated with her, mm -hmm. so that people really connected aspects of the um, life of the creatures with the life of the goddess. They mm -hmm. recognized patterns in, say, the regeneration of the uh, butterfly from the chrysalis. Yes. They recognize that as a symbol of her power to regenerate life. Yes, out of so they would, death. <laughs> and they would regard that insect, that butterfly, as sacred because yes. of that connection. Yes. That symbolical connection. Yes. And then the flowers became, some particular flowers um, became associated with her, and then plants and everything, and the, the capacity to heal came from her which was given to the plants, which in turn the people, the humans, would be able to distill and use for their own healing. So there was a sort of con continuum or a continuous yes, thread. Yes, nothing was split, nothing everything. was separated. Nothing was, was fragmented, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what role did the male play in lunar mythology? We've talked so much about her, what about him? Uh, well, the male played, at this time, he was her son and lover in the great mythologies of Sumeria and Egypt and, and Greece also. I think that you, you have the um, idea that uh, the son or the daughter, say Persephone, or in um, the case of Inanna, um, it wasn't her son but her lover, descended into the underworld and she had to go in search of him. And Demeter had to call 
Hermes to go in search of her daughter and bring that child forth from the underworld. So the, the male was more the son lover, like in the myths of Attis and Kybele, for instance. Um, I can't remember at this moment any other ones. But um, Attis was the dying crop, so to speak, or Osiris was the dying crop. Isis and Kybele were the, the grieving mother who went in search of him in the underworld mm -hmm. and brought him forth as the regenerated crop in the spring. Mm -hmm. so, so that was his, his mythological role. Mm -hmm. He didn't have a godlike role any more than really she had a goddess role at that time. She was the great mother. Mm -hmm. And all of us. And all of us. And, and the sun was the, the life of the earth. Yes, that seems uh, to be a beautiful aspect though is that while the mother, the female image, is giving birth and taking that life back into her womb and then giving birth out of the death of the person again, that the male is that which she gives birth to in a sense, that she, he is the person born in time and space who yeah. lives and dies and returns to the great mother. But he can also relate to the feminine not only as mother, but as lover, that are two different aspects of the feminine. And two different, and two different aspects of the masculine, yes. Yes, yes. So that Both the son and the lover. Yes, and if a culture actually lived out the archetype literally by the mother uh, taking a son as a lover, as, as some people think actually happened, uh, then it was a uh, perhaps misunderstanding, you might say, of the archetypal significance or yes, it was a fusion of the archetypal and the human world. Yes, I, I was just thinking about Egypt with the pharaoh marrying his sister. That was really, in marrying his sister, he was marrying the goddess. Mm -hmm. And so that was the importance of that incestuous marriage, as it were. It was an archetypal enactment. Yes, I think that's so important because so many people have talked about it in a very derogatory way of... of the behavior of people in prehistory. And I think that it's very clear, very important to get the archetype as the feminine who is the archetype of the mother and she relates to the male as mother and the archetype of the spouse or the feminine, the consort, who then can relate to the male as consort. That these are two different ways of relating. They mm. are not necessarily fused as it has been done perhaps in societies, early societies. Yes, as you said. That, yeah, I think that's so. I think it's it's quite complicated, and it's so different. It's such a different kind of mythology that we don't realize, perhaps, also that the person who um, was head of the society, like say the pharaoh in Egypt with his queen, that they actually incarnated the divine. They were divine, mm -hmm. and that lingered on really um, even in our own time. That in Charles the First, the King Charles the First, who was beheaded he believed in the divine right of, of the king to um, that it was passed on through the bloodline, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So this is a very ancient tradition that the, the king or the ruler um, is divine. Mm -hmm. And that comes through from, from this lunar uh, Bronze Age rituals, I mm -hmm. think, where the sacred marriage, this was one of the most important images, the sacred marriage of heaven and earth, and uh, personified by a man and a woman, or the king and the, the queen, or the king and the priestess, whatever it was, uh, this sacred marriage was what held everything together. Yes, because the polarities had come together and there was no split. Mm. You were talking about the divinity of the king, but in fact, in the ancient lunar mythology, everyone was divine. So it was it then just the king that carried on that divinity into uh, uh, the yes, solar the, age. the king transmitted, for instance mm -hmm. in Egypt, the king transmitted the divinity f uh, to the whole community from the goddess Hathor. Mm -hmm. And it was his um, union, his annual union with the goddess Hathor, symbolically, mm -hmm. which regenerated the whole culture. Mm -hmm. And that's beautiful. It's a lovely image. Yes, yes. and Hathor is such a powerful well, Hathor was extraordinary. Goddess, yeah, yes. She so was a wonderful goddess. And she was the Milky Way. Oh yes, yeah. and he gets his energy and divinity from her and it flows through him to all life. Is that the way it works? All, all life and the whole community. Mm -hmm. And that's what the meaning of the Uraeus that he wore on his uh, crown as king of the two uh, higher and lower Egypt. That's what that Uraeus meant. It was the image of the goddess which he wore in this place on his forehead. Mm -hmm. 
And so that was an image of the serpent. Of the, of the, of the serpent goddess. Goddess, yeah. uh -huh. And the power, is really the power of the serpent mm -hmm. goddess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What other uh, symbols? I think maybe it would be a good idea to talk about the image of the serpent in lunar mythology. Because here we see it very, very powerfully uh, symbolized in, in e Egypt. In Egypt and also in India. I think that these early cultures, the serpent was the primary image of regeneration mm -hmm. in all these early cultures. And it was always, a, a, certainly in, in Egypt and uh, in India, associated with the goddess. And we know in India, for instance, the whole concept of Kundalini rising was the goddess herself mm -hmm. rising through serpent the serpent power. The serpent <laughs> yeah. power, yes. Mm -hmm. There's some, as I traveled through Asia looking at these pictures in the museums, one of the ones that came up over and over again was the Buddha sitting on the coils of a gigantic mm -hmm. serpent with its hood spread out behind his head. Mm -hmm. Really beautiful image. And this struck me deeply. And then I had a dream of my own of this same great serpent. And it was then that I realized the importance of, of instinct. And that's where we probably should start next time because I think you should tell that dream of the serpent that you had okay. in southern France. I think there are two dreams that I need to tell you. One is a dream about the moon and the other is the dream about a great serpent. So shall we start with the yes, moon Yes, let's do that. Okay, well that one I had quite some time after the dream about the goddess. But in this one I was traveling in a rocket to the moon and I landed there, somewhat to my surprise, and there I saw a completely desolate moon. There was no life, no vegetation, no animals, no humans, absolutely nothing, except a gigantic iron tower, like the Eiffel Tower, built on the surface of the moon and towering high above it, maybe 300 feet above it. And I looked at this and I thought, you know, what's happened? And then I traveled in some kind of vehicle across the surface of the moon in which I saw that there was no life. It was all desiccated and dead. And I landed in a kind of pool of water, a large kind of, not a lake exactly, but a large pool of water. And then I woke up. So I took this dream as the opening dream to Gerhard Adler when I went to see whether I could train as an analyst. And he said, what do you think it means? And I said, I have no idea, even though I'd had many years of analysis with another Jungian an an analyst, I still didn't know what it meant. And he said, well, I think it's to do with the feminine principle and the, the, the plight of the feminine principle as the moon is the primary image of the feminine principle, what's happened? The moon is all dead and desiccated, and what is this great iron tower that's been built on its surface? And then I realized that the iron tower was, was actually the civilization or the culture that we've imposed on the, uh, the, the lunar aspect of our mm -hmm. nature, mm -hmm. and that this was something in myself that had to be dismantled piece mm -hmm. by piece, and as well as being dismantled in the culture as a whole. Mm -hmm. So that was a really very important dream which set the tone um, of my future life. And so After that mm -hmm. dream of the goddess, it sort of gave me a more concise image of what needed to be done, both within myself and within the culture. And what a contrast to the beauty of the symbolism of the moon in lunar culture, and then this image of what we have done yes. to that aspect of our psyche. Exactly. We've literally destroyed the feminine. Mm -hmm. So that was a very graphic image. And the other dream, which also was equally important, was, um, I don't know exactly when in relation to the moon dream, but sometime within five years, say, it was that I was in the south of France and standing at the edge of a deep ravine there, and out of the ravine suddenly came this gigantic serpent, really terrifying, because it was... <laughs> 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 that would be terrifying. Yeah, I mean, it was absolutely colossal. It filled the whole ravine. And it, <laughs> and it had, because I'd been in India, I, I recognized that it was the, uh, the great serpent that mm -hmm. really uh, guarded the Buddha on the night of his awakening, although I didn't think about that in the dream. But it had many uh, hoods spread out behind it, and it indicated, again, it didn't speak, but it, uh, there was a ladder behind me, and I was on a sort of ledge in the dream, rather precariously um, perched there with this great serpent in front of me. It was quite benevolent, it was in no way threatening, and it indicated that I had the choice of either staying on the ledge where I was, 
or of climbing this ladder which was behind me. So I gave a very deep bow, a, a reverential bow, and I said, well, I choose to climb the ladder. And later I understood that this was really the, the ladder of consciousness. Well, that's beautiful. But it was so beautifully and clearly expressed, and if I hadn't had that dream, I never would have thought of the instinct as something which is absolutely primary and is what relates us to the cosmos. Now, that's beautiful. And that is uh, seen in Indian culture, as you mentioned, with the Kundalini, because the serpent is at the base at the of base. the spine, yes. which is the base of who we are. Exactly. And it rises gradually until it's reached its fulfillment yes. and full enlightenment. And that's what the king represented. And that's what the king mm -hmm. used to represent, mm -hmm. yes, in the olden mm -hmm. times. Um, and of course that connected me back to the culture of India and the whole science of um, consciousness to do with the principle of Kundalini rising up through the seven chakras and until it flowers in the thousand petal ho yes. lotus. And in India, that uh, mythology was allowed to develop even with the incoming tribes. Absolutely, But yes. in Eastern Europe and in Greece and later in Crete, it was much more limited. But we know that in the Neolithic, in Old Europe, the serpent was also a very powerful symbol of just what you've said, just what you've talked about. Yeah, well, I think that's what's so interesting what, about what has been discovered. And one finds the serpent in all kinds of forms and shapes, not only in Gibrutus' work, but in the other archaeologists who've worked with mm -hmm. um, Greece and, and yes. uh, Anatolia. Mm -hmm. And um, that comes on into Gnosticism, too, where the serpent is quite a prominent symbol or image. Mm -hmm. And I know that you're going to talk about Gnosticism later, but it is important now just that you've made that point, is yeah. that the serpent that existed very powerfully in European Neolithic culture then was undergrounded, you might say, once these Eastern tribes began to come in and destroy that culture, but it surfaces again in Gnosticism. It does, but I think that we can look at the myth of the fall perhaps in the next, um, when we talk again, mm -hmm. um, because there the, the serpent is really uh, demoted, demoted from the position exactly. that it held in lunar culture, as indeed Eve is. She's demoted from the goddess into a human woman, and she's blamed for bringing sin, suffer, suffering, and death mm -hmm. into the world. So instead of the goddess giving birth to the whole of life, you have a, a, a woman, a primal ancestress, an, ancestress, oh, an ancestral woman, um, bringing death, evil, and suffering into the world. It's such a complete reversion of the older mythology. It's, it's complete reversion. Mm -hmm. And the serpent there, of course, is evil. It's the and voice it becomes of the associated devil. with the evil yes. and with sexuality, mm -hmm. uh, something dangerous and mm -hmm. um, really something that has to be ground under man's foot. Exactly. And then it becomes, mm -hmm. later on in the solar era, it becomes the, the, the dragon or the serpent who has to be crushed by the, by the hero. And this, then you have the great conflict between light and darkness, which mm -hmm. belongs to the mythology of the solar era. Yes, that great split. And mm. here is the, the, what was previously such a beautiful combination of the cosmic earth goddess and the serpent and the tree. Exactly, and the tree of life. Mm, yes, maybe you could say just a little bit. I know we'll come back to the tree, but the symbolism of the tree in lunar mythology. Well, I think the, the symbolism of the tree may not be known so much in Neolithic times, it may have been part of the mythology, but the tree we know was very important. There was always a tree in the temple of the goddess, for instance, there was always a sycamore tree, mm -hmm. which gave milky, milky sap and um, was very highly regarded. And then there was, the, of course, the tree of life in Kabbalah, which must have come down from this earlier yes. time, and that we'll come back to later, I think, because that's so important. And the trees of Sarah at Hebron, and the goddesses, the priestesses, always had groves of trees. Exactly, yes. And the groves were always on the tops of hills in the um, sort of culture over Europe. So the top of the hill was sacred. It wasn't a place for being fortified against an enemy. Mm -hmm. It was the place where the goddess was worshipped. Mm -hmm. The tree of life is, is an immensely important symbol that goes not only in these cultures, but also indigenous cultures. Of, uh, of America and um, also of India. So it's something that goes through many different world mythologies. It is definitely, and yeah. it's a part of... Uh, and it was a connecting symbol. Yes, it connected 
What did it connect? Well, it connected all life together. All aspects of life mm -hmm. were branches of the tree, so to speak, mm -hmm. and the tree was rooted in the divine mm -hmm. world. Um, which was a world of darkness. <laughs> which was a world of mystery, uh -huh. yeah. And then its branches reached out to the sun, to the cosmos. Yes, exactly. And then all of the fruit. And there were, there were so many uh, images of the tree that had people and serpents and fruits and all kinds of it. All it was a whole universe images. practically. Yeah, it was like the, the tree. Golden, the fruit which, um, what is it, the apples of Hesperides, for instance, in Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. There are many different uh, ones that one could think of. But generally speaking, that earlier time sanctified the earth and sanctified everything on it. Mm -hmm. and, and that is the perspective that, that we've lost and that we mm -hmm. need to recover today urgently. Mm -hmm. Yes, what you have really been talking about are these core principles of the lunar age in which everything was a unit, was, separate, was connected and unified, and that there was trust in the universe. Yes, I think that I think Jules uh, found the phrase. She said, "A sacred, living, and unified whole." I think she said. She That's beautiful. A sacred, sacred, living, living and unified, unified whole. whole. Mm -hmm. And so that would be really an expression of that, of that lunar time. age. That's exactly. beautiful. Yeah.